In the eyes of the beholder, in the eyes of the beholder, the men were beautiful even though they had been reduced to rags. The one who beheld them was Colonel Charles Brown, commander of the 1st of the 91st Infantry. And he wrote on that day what he saw there in Bilibid Prison, there in Manila, Philippines, uh, on November 1st, 1944. By that time, um, Colonel Brown and his men had been incarcerated by the Empire of Japan for almost three years. They had survived the Bataan Death March that began on April 9, 1942. They had survived being, being moved from one tropical hell to another. And now they had landed in the infamous Bilibid prison. Colonel Brown felt a certain urgency about writing to his family to let them know how he was doing. The urgency came from a rumor that he was hearing over and over again was that MacArthur was returning to the Philippines and he was going to lay siege to it, which was good news for most people, but not if you were a prisoner of war because he knew that meant that his whole unit would be transferred on a cargo ship to mainland Japan a hazardous journey now that America's Pacific Fleet had complete control of the oceans with their cruisers and destroyers and submarines. And so, Colonel Brown took the only paper he had, pieces of toilet paper, and he began to write carefully about his life to his family, Harry and Gail Swergen's family. I will tell you, it's a very hard letter to read. The men were issued no shoes. Therefore, they worked from sunup to sundown in the fields barefoot. They were given no soap or medicine. So all of them, each one of them, was acutely ill. Colonel Brown himself uh, suffered 26 to 28 bouts of malarial fever each of those three years. They were fed just enough rations to keep a hamster alive, so they were emaciated and gaunt and looked as if they had walked off a photograph of Auschwitz. And, of course, they were offered no clothes. And so they, their, what they did wear were shreds of fetid, filthy rags. But what makes the letter so compelling is that after reporting this, Colonel Brown breaks off and speaks of the beauty that he discerns. He breaks off with these words, Now I will speak of more pleasant things, of those friends I have made and the influence that they've had on me. First he says, there's Major Art Moray from Trinidad, Colorado. He is my second command a valiant and courageous man in whom I put my complete repose and trust. There's, uh, uh, there's Val Knowles, a Britisher from Barbados. There's Jean Nerd Nerdlinger, Nerdlinger, a lawyer from Chicago. There's Polly Humber, uh, with whom I trained at Fort Benning, Georgia in the infantry school, and we have retained our friendship until this time. Uh, there's Stephen Z. Wheeler from St. Paul, an, an, an unusual and affable man. And there's Andy Zaveska from Milwaukee, who is a regular Army officer. All of these men have buoyed me up in my time of need. But I must tell you about Father Braun, a major in the Chaplaincy Corps, a member of the Franciscan Order, he has turned me toward God. And there is John Morritt, who spent a year in the Episcopal Seminary when he answered the call of his country and has become an artillery officer. He has strengthened and confirmed me in my faith. Not that my faith is yet strong enough or unassailable, 
But I can tell you that religion is the active force in my life. So mother, can I tell you how pleasant it is to hear that you too have been confirmed. And now we are joined in that communion underneath our Heavenly Father. 73 years separates Colonel Brown's letter from you and me. And yet, what he writes is prophecy. Would you agree? He tells us that if we turn towards God, if we answer his invitation and we turn towards God, we will begin to see beauty even if we're assaulted by hell itself. And that, in my mind, is the more pressing and the more concrete message of the transfiguration of Jesus. We will begin to behold beauty. We'll see the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ. We will follow Peter and James and John up that unnamed mountain. And we will see Jesus not so much as that itinerant rabbi who stupefied one dusty village after another in Galilee and Judea, but we'll see him in his, in his radiant glory as the one through all things were created and all things will be created. We will realize his dazzling love is so powerful that no power can eclipse it, no matter how ubiquitous we think it may be. We'll also recall that that Jesus who is so radiant on the mountain walks down that slope. And when he gets to the bottom, St. Luke is very clear. He turns his face towards Jerusalem. There he will be betrayed, captured, tormented, tortured, and marched to Calvary to be ex executed. But before they do that, they will whip him until his robes are nothing but tattered, bloody rags. It's the beauty of this Jesus that Colonel Brown knows is encamped with him at Bilibid Prison. This Jesus who knows the pain of humanity. This Jesus whose pathos, this Jesus whose love is beyond anything human beings can comprehend. Perhaps even, perhaps even Colonel Brown recited the poetic lines from Isaiah. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He took on the punishment that was ours and made us whole. And by his wounds, we are healed. Isaiah 53, 5. We'll also see the beauty of one another. We'll begin to see the beauty of one another. We'll no longer look at others and, and think that they're just rank and file human beings. Not, no longer will we think they're undifferentiated um, um, anonymous flesh bags of ignominious protoplasm. No, we'll see each other for who we are. Miracles. Miracles. And we'll realize that the incandescent, the iridescent love of Christ is present in those who are, who are surrounding us. That those who come alongside us are indeed ambassadors of Christ our Lord. It's a message that St. John so badly wanted to put over to his fledgling and, fledgling and struggling congregation uh, there in, at the end of the first century. He says to them, Beloved, we are God's children now, but what we shall be has not yet been revealed. But when, but when Jesus is revealed to us, we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He is. When Jesus is revealed to us, we shall be like Him, for we'll see Him like He is. The reflection of God Almighty is imprinted on His children. We are surrounded by miracles. Thirdly, we'll begin to see ourselves we'll begin to behold ourselves as beautiful. I think that's particularly important today as we prepare to 
baptized Molly Catherine Butler. I, I hope, we hope, that she will begin to see herself as a dazzling reflection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That she'll walk up that mountain and she'll see Jesus for who He is and see those who surround her as who they are. She will behold their beauty. And she will know that she is a singular, supernatural reflection, glittering reflection of the Lord Himself. I met with the family on on Friday, and I said, raise this child. I beg you to raise this child in the womb of faith so she will see herself as who she is and not as some imposter. St. Paul wrote to the Colossians in one of his most magnetic letters, if you've been raised with Christ, seek things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of the Father. If you have been raised with Christ, get your head out of the gutter and on the eyes of Jesus. If you've been raised with Christ, get over your obsession with self and see the beauty that God has put all around you and me. And live as that supernatural being that Christ has created you to be. This is not a part-time vocation. To live under the aegis of Christ, to realize that we have been imbued with His beauty, is not a part-time vocation. It is our ultimate and permanent and abiding vocation. You know, Colonel Brown walked up that mountain and he saw Jesus for who he was. And his buddies from, from Chicago and Milwaukee and Colorado and Georgia and all points in between, he saw them for who they were and he began to realize who he was. He saw all this. He walked up that mountain before he was loaded on that cargo ship. And midway between Manila and Japan, that ship was torpedoed. And Colonel Brown died before his letter ever got to Harry and Gail's family. But let me make this promise to you. We have invited up that mountain with Peter and James and John and Charles Brown and so many others, a number that no one can calculate. And we will see Jesus for who He is and His beauty that transcends any beauty that we can possibly, possibly imagine. And we'll begin to see the beauty of one, one another and we'll, be going, we'll, we'll get around one another and we'll go, handle with care, my Lord, this is, this is an ambassador of Jesus. And we'll look in the mirror. We'll look in the mirror and we'll see the splendid, glittering eyes of Christ looking right back at us.